welcome to The Code Tray, the podcast of the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMEDPRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the Libraries Entry section of the ACCP Communities website. My objectives for today are to review the management of ventilator-associated pneumonia, also I'll be referring to as VAP from here on out, to discuss previous literature on prophylaxis of VAP, and then additionally to evaluate the ProVAP trial and the impact that it has on our current practice today. To start with some background, VAP, as we all know, is one of the leading causes of healthcare-associated infections that impact our critically ill patients that we see. VAP is defined as Pneumonia occurring more than 48 hours after intubation, and it can be classified as early or late VAP. An early onset VAP occurs within four days of hospitalization. Patients with an acute brain injury are at an increased risk of developing early VAP. And this is simply thought due to the theory of aspiration prior to patients being intubated or an immune system depression within those first few days of the brain injury. Guidelines do exist to attempt to prevent early VAP. That includes selective oropharyngeal decontamination, or SOD, and also selective digestive tract decontamination. And this is using prophylactic antibiotic regimen. So SOD is consisting of topical antibiotic paste, where SDD contains a paste, but also a suspension. These are essentially used to prevent colonization of bacteria, essentially preventing any further hospital acquired infections. So these strategies are commonly put in place to help prevent things such as VAP. However, there isn't very clear data on the benefit of using a short-term antibiotic prophylaxis for VAP. As you can imagine, there's concern for resistance, which kind of helps lead to the idea behind doing the ProVAP trial. Before I get into talking about the trial, I did want to discuss and just kind of remind everyone of our guideline recommended empiric treatment for VAP. So empiric treatment of VAP does come from our Infectious Diseases Society of America, or IDSA, 2016 guidelines for HAP and VAP. And our guidelines recommend empirically covering for Staph aureus and Pseudomonas, so specifically MSSA, and also covering for M- MRSA in patients who have a risk factor for resistance, patients who are being treated in units where there are more than 10 to 20 percent of Staph aureus that's methicillin resistant or patients that are treated in units where the prevalence of MRSA is actually unknown. The recommended agents are for MSSA, piperacillin-tazobactam, cefepine, levofloxacin, imipenem or meripenem, whereas our agents of choice for MRSA are vancomycin or linazolid. In terms of pseudomonas, so it's recommended to double cover for pseudomonas in patients who have a risk factor for a type of resistance. If there are more than 10% of gram-negative isolates that are resistant, and then also in an IC where the antibiotic susceptibility rates are not available. And then the agents recommended for pseudomonas coverage are those that are also used for MSSA coverage. In terms of risk factors for a multi-drug resistant VAP, they include prior IV antibiotic use within 90 days, septic shock or ARDS at the time or preceding VAP, five or more days of hospitalization prior to the occurrence of VAP, or if a patient is on renal replacement therapy prior to VAP onset. And additionally, risk factors specifically for MRSA or pseudomonas VAP do include prior IV antibiotic use within 90 days. So these are obviously very important risk factors to consider when choosing empiric treatment in patients with ventilator-associated pneumonia. So that was obviously a very brief overview of our IDSA guidelines on empiric treatment of VAP, but I did want to provide more information into the previous studies that kind of led to this trial that I'll further be discussing. So the first study done in 2019 was the Antarctic trial. So this is the prevention of early ventilated associated pneumonia after cardiac arrest. It was a multi-center, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. It looked at adult patients that were admitted to the ICU who were ventilated after an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. It compared IV amoxicillin clavulanate versus placebo for two days, and the primary outcome was the incidence of early VAP. As you can see, the incidence of early VAP in patients who received IV amoxicillin clavulanate was lower in those patients at 19% versus 34% in patients that received placebo for a p-value of 0.03. So there was a lower incidence of early VAP in patients that did receive antibiotic prophylaxis, 
However, secondary outcomes that they looked at really had no difference. So no difference in late VAP, ventilator-free days, length of stay in the ICU, or mortality. Another study that was done in 2022, this is the effect of selective decontamination of the digestive tract on hospital mortality in critically ill patients receiving mechanical ventilation. This was a crossover cluster randomized clinical trial, and it looked at adult patients who were intubated and admitted to the ICU. Of note, they did do a post hoc analysis of patients who had an acute brain injury. The intervention that they looked at in this study was the selective decontamination of the digestive tract. So this included an oral paste, gastric suspension, and IV antibiotics for four days. The IV antibiotic that was picked was either third generation cephalosporin or ciprofloxacin. And this is simply compared to just the standard of care. The primary outcome that they looked at was in hospital mortality within 90 days and actually saw that there was no difference in the original study between patients who received SDD versus standard of care. However, in the post hoc analysis, looking at patients with acute brain injury, it was noted that patients who received the SDD did have a lower mortality, 32% versus 38%. These trials kind of set the foundation and the question of whether one dose of prophylactic IV antibiotics could prevent BAP in patients, specifically patients who have an acute brain injury. So that is what is what going to lead me to talking about my trial today. So ceftriaxone to prevent early ventilator associated pneumonia in patients with acute brain injury, also referred to as Profibac. And this was published in 2024 in The Lancet. This was a multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled superiority trial across nine French university hospitals from October 2015 to May of 2020. The purpose was to determine the effect of a one-time dose of an antibiotic prophylaxis on the development of early VAP in patients who had acute brain injury. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive a one-time dose of ceftriaxone 2 grams over 30 minutes versus placebo, so normal saline within 12 hours of intubation. Of note, preventative VAP measures were done, such as like washing hands, stress ulcer prophylaxis, things of that nature. However, there was not any SOD or SCD that was done in this study. And of note, these preventative VAP measures that they did do, they did not account for or look at the effects of these in this study. So simply just the antibiotic versus the placebo. If VAP was suspected in any patients that were in the ICU, the modified clinical pulmonary infection score was then calculated. In addition, a chest radiography was done and quantitative sampling was also performed. Patients were assessed by ICU physicians for FAP up until day 28. And once again, if FAP was, if FAP was suspected, a central adjudication committee was part of this trial, which reviewed cases of VAP just to see if there was any, um, to limit the amount of bias that would have been there. VAP was defined using the American Thoracic Society criteria, and this involves all the following. So they needed at least two criteria of clinical aspects. So this includes fever, hypothermia, leukocytosis or leukopenia, or purulent endotracheal aspiration. They also needed a newer modification of a previously existing condensation. They also needed a microbiological criteria, so a positive bacterial analysis of the respiratory tract, or depending on what type of sampling was done, um, had to meet a certain amount of colony forming units. Patients were included if they had a GCS of 12 or less, and they were predicted to require ventilation for more than 48 hours after experiencing a head trauma, stroke, or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Patients were excluded if they were intubated for 48 hours after admission. They had a coma that was due to some other cause, such as a tumor, cardiac arrest, maybe an infectious disease also. If they were nasally intubated, if they had previous hospitalization within the past month, if antibi antibiotic prophylaxis was expected within the first 24 hours after randomization, and of course, other exclusion criteria we think of as well, such as high risk of death within the first 48 hours, allergy to medications we were using, such as beta-lactam, or currently had on antibiotic treatment. The primary outcome was the development of early VAP from the second to seventh day of mechanical ventilation. And they had a long list of secondary outcomes. I won't read all of them to you, but of note, they did do most of these at day 28. And then ones with the stars next to them, they looked at these outcomes at day 60 as well. In terms of statistical analysis, so a sample size of 354 patients was predicted um, in order to meet a 90% power with a two, 
two-sided type 1 error of 5%. And this was based on, based on previous studies of VAP incidents, specifically in patients with acute brain injury. They also did an attention to treat analysis and other statistical analysis tests, such as fine grain model, chi-squared, Fisher's exact test, T-test, and man whitney u tests were used for things such as using the incidence of VAP, categorical data, continuous data. Looking at baseline characteristics, so there was a total of 319 patients that were included in this, in this study. Ceftriaxone group had 162 patients and placebo had 157. The groups were barely balanced between the two, just to kind of briefly go over some of these things. So average age was, you know, mid to late 50s, mostly males in the placebo group, but it was pretty close in the ceftriaxone group as well. Similar past medical history of chronic diseases. Of note, the main brain injury in these patients was subarachnoid hemorrhage, and then second was brain trauma. Their SAP score, so SAPS2 is the Simplified Acute Physiology Score. It's kind of similar to an Apache score that predicts mortality in ICU patients. I mean, it looks at, I think, 15 to 17 different values in the past 24 hours. Or of 40 indicates 25% mortality, whereas greater than 52 indicates 50% mortality. So these patients were fairly moderate, moderately um, sick. They had a baseline GCS score of anywhere from four to eight in both groups. And they had a similar time from when they were intubated to when they received their uh, treatment. In terms of results, so there were initially 160 cases of VAP that were reported, 69 in the ceftriaxone group and 91 in the placebo group. And this was 160 cases in 139 patients, so one patient could have multiple episodes of VAP. However, after the adjudication committee reviewed these suspected cases of VAP, it actually determined that 93 cases were actually confirmed. So 35 in the ceftriaxone group and 58 in placebo. And this was 93 cases and 90 patients. So this right here just kind of shows you how easily it is to overdiagnose that and the importance of this adjudication committee to get a second look at these patients. Looking at our results, our permanent outcome, reminder, this is the development of early VAP from the second to the seventh day of mechanical ventilation. And in the image below, the image on the left side of the screen is the early VAP, whereas the right side is late VAP. So you can see on the left side, early VAP, 14% of patients who received ceftriaxone experienced early VAP compared to 32% of patients who received placebo, which was statistically significant with a PVAP of 0.03. Moving into some of our secondary outcomes, these were on this screen were ones that were done at day 28. And just kind of a blanket statement, ceftriaxone was pretty predominant in almost all secondary outcomes. So looking at all cases of VAP, you can see that 20% of patients in ceftriaxone had some type of VAP, whether that's early or late, whereas placebo had higher incidence of VAP at 36%. The incidence of late, late VAP was actually pretty similar between the two. The patients who received ceftriaxone also had more ventilator-free days and antibiotic-free days compared to patients that were in the placebo group. And additionally, I wanted to point out the last one on here, mortality, that patients who received ceftriaxone did have 15% incidence of mortality compared to placebo at 25%. Next are our additional secondary outcomes, but these were looked at at um, day 60. So once again, ceftriaxone had more ICU-free days compared to the placebo group. Ceftriaxone also had more hospital-free days as well. And once again, looking at mortality, patients who received ceftriaxone did have a lower incidence of mortality at 20% compared to 30% in our placebo group. One of the secondary outcomes I wanted to definitely take the time to talk about was the microbiological um, documentation of those confirmed early VAP cases and the different bacteria that grew, like split up between obviously our gram-negative and our gram-positive. The bacteria that was most commonly isolated in these cases, so our first one was our MSSA, as you can see, 30% in the ceftriaxone group versus 49 in the placebo group. Next are our streptococcus species, 35% in ceftriaxone group versus 29 in our placebo group. Next highest was our Haemophilus influenza, which actually had 0% in ceftriaxone versus 33 in our placebo group. Then the last highest was our E. coli, 18% in ceftriaxone group versus 6% in our placebo. It isn't really all that surprising that ceftriaxone prevented VAP due to organisms such as H. flu, coli, as we know that ceftriaxone cover these organisms and they more represent a community-acquired pneumonia picture, a cat picture, rather than those nosocomial organisms we think of associated with 
our, our bath. So from this trial, the authors concluded that patients with an acute brain injury who were admitted to the ICU and received mechanical ventilation may benefit from early administration of a single dose of ceftriaxone in order to reduce the incidence of early VAP, exposure to ventilation and antibiotics, and decrease prolonged ICU and hospital stay while also improving mortality. It's easy to say there are many strengths and weaknesses when it comes to looking at this trial. So first looking at strengths, the design in itself, so it being a multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, obviously these are our gold standard trials that we aim for. Additionally, I think the implementation of the adjudication committee was, was good as you saw that there were way more cases that were overly diagnosed of VAP and this committee was put in place to help prevent any reporting bias that may have, may have been there. Lastly, I think ceftriaxone chosen as an agent was appropriate and, you know, targets those common respiratory organisms that we, that I briefly mentioned before. In terms of weaknesses, I do think there is some limited external validity as this study was completely conducted in France and different ICUs in France. Um, I think it's also important to think about, well, we probably don't know what these antibiograms look at at these hospitals and maybe what guidelines they use um, if they are using our IDSA guidelines. So I think that's definitely something that can limit that generalizability to us here in the United States. Additionally, as I mentioned in the beginning, talking about the methods, um, other forms of VAT prevention were implemented, but they were not monitored. So it's kind of hard to say how this was, this could have affected the results. And then lastly, although there showed to be some benefit with ceftriaxone in our secondary outcomes. The study was actually not powered for these secondary outcomes. In terms of how I think this could impact current practice and just my conclusion about my thoughts on the study, as I mentioned a couple times, I do think VAP may be overly diagnosed, leading to unnecessary treatment. Antibiotic prophylaxis with ceftriaxone, specifically from this study, may prevent more of a cat picture, community-acquired pneumonia, rather than a that picture when we think of those more multi-drug resistant organisms, those nosocomal organisms as well. I do think that there is insufficient evidence from this study to change institution protocols, but I do think it's a good first step into what the previous studies have shown as well. With that, um, I would like to conclude my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest, and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.